of the handout today. I would be happy to discuss any case or issue you may have with regard to the case. Uh, John's agreed to uh, and been kind enough to do the uh, overview and intro. Uh, we're going to limit him to 15 minutes. Can somebody <laughs> bash him over the head if he takes more? <laughs> 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 All right. We hear about it, the Hague Convention. We hear about it all the time. And actually, there's no one Hague Convention. There are 39 of them. Um, the Hague Conventions on private and international law came in being really in the last century as a result of the Industrial Revolution more than anything else. And as you know, Europe has a lot of different jurisdictions. Uh, some of them small, some of them pretty good size. In commercial disputes, whenever there's money, there's a fight. And they attempted to blend various laws or various legal traditions into one so they could better facilitate commerce. And as they went along, they added to it. And we have, gee, we've got... Uh, Conventions for the sales of goods, the succession to decedents' estates, divorce now, and uh, child abduction. Now, we're most familiar, or we hear most of the time, about the Hague Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction. That is different than what we're going to talk about today. We're not going to talk about that at all. I do want to touch on one aspect of it very briefly. That is, to distinguish what we're talking about today. We're talking about in personam jurisdiction. That's all we're talking about. Because we're talking about service here of civil or commercial, uh, or ex judicial and extra -judi judicial documents. That means in personam only. The Hague Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction deals with subject matter jurisdiction whether the court can act at all. Now, since we have to deal with, and I put it on the, the board, we have to deal with the Hague Convention from time to time, this is a tremendous resource right there on the board. That will get you all the Hague Conventions. And the Hague Convention on the service abroad of judicial and extra judicial documents is a skinny thing. It's only 10 pages. It's easy read. It's not hard. None of this is hard today. Um, <clears throat> we know that the Hague Convention at this time, and I say at this time, applies to dependency actions. And Ernesto is going to talk to you a little bit about the case law on that. We, I'm not going to get too far into it, but there seems to be some judicial antipathy towards the Hague Convention as it applies to dependency actions. Nevertheless, um, I would point out this Hague Convention can be your best friend. Because quite often here, we have the mother and the fathers of Mexico, Guatemala, or could be somewhere else, and uh, we have to get in for some jurisdiction on her. Particularly if she gives you enough information where they, they could find him a presumed father. Now, under the Hague Convention, service process is pretty much deemed effectuated at the passage of six months. That's a good chunk of time for us in dependency world. And if you've got a druggy mother who needs to get cleaned up, that six months can be a gift. Use it as a sword. There, we will talk a bit about the requirements, and the requirements, you want me to go? Yeah, okay, fine. The requirements are, are, are similar. You file a petition, usually there's a detention report, um, and then there's notice of the hearing. Those, if, for instance, you were going to Mexico, have to be served on a central authority or some other designated reception point for the receiving state, okay? 
And it's important to keep in mind because some receiving states will allow you to serve a consular official. We don't. You'll see that our <coughs> exceptions and our reservations to the treaty, and by the way, folks, this is a treaty ratified by the Senate. As such, it has constitutional stature. And that's important for you to be able to argue. Under the Supremacy Clause, it's supreme. It overrides state constitutional law, state decisional law, and state statutory law. Flat out. It, it, it wrote rules. So you want to keep that in mind, because if you have to argue it, and we hear bench officers all the time telling us, I'm here to protect children, I'm going to go ahead. No way. Make your objection. You want to make the objection, because that's going to preserve issues for any appellate act. And may even get you, if you're in front of a referee, a rehearing, depending on who the judge is or reads it. Um, some judges are familiar with this, some aren't. The documents usually are served in duplicate. And I told Ellen I will give her these, and I'm going to get them out. <coughs> they are, you have to translate the documents being served in, uh, these forms, it has to be translated into the native language or a designated language by the receiving state. That's important because there's an official language for some states, and other states have a bunch of languages in it. Um, gee, I don't know how many languages are spoken in Mexico. It's not just Spanish. Now, Mexico probably uses Spanish as its default language. But they could tell you um, to translate them for somebody in the Yucatan, if they wish, into a Mayan dialect. And if that's their requirement, we got to do it. But that's also something to keep in mind, because uh, you think that we have interpreters for every language known to man or God in this country, in this state, and we don't. I did a Mongolian adoption a couple of years ago, <coughs> and we need documents translated. I went to the Judicial Council. They listen. We have Mongolian interpreters until you call them and they don't. And then we call you CLA. Berkeley, call them all, and we have people who study Mongolian history and language, and they don't feel comfortable translating. So I had to send the documents to Umum Bittar, have them translated, not tell them that I'm adopting out a 15-year-old citizen of theirs, and they send it back because they want the girls. It's a very, very underpopulated country for an Asian country. They would grab her back. So Henning did the adoption, and uh, come get her if you can. Okay. <clears throat> the bottom line is, we may not be able to translate it. That puts a mention service. That gives you more time. There are actual specific, and I've given them to Ellen, documents that accompany the uh, documents that you're serving. And you get those off the net, right here. I'll scan these and send them Take a look at them. They're either filled out in the language that the receiving state requests, or French or English. Now, English is no problem for us, uh, but it may be for receiving state, and they may prefer it in French. You know, DCFS, you're given notice, do it. They may also request it in their particular language. Please look at that, make sure they hit the central authority. The central authorities for all nation states Sigma sign this is right there. All you have to do is click, you can get right to it. Um, then look at the reservations, which are attached, and we got them, and there are a lot of them. That's why this thing's 83 pages, and I, now I misplaced. Oh, here it is. You got all these reservations. Please pay attention to those reservations that are in the back, because that will tell you what, how each individual state varies slightly the Hague Convention service requirements and who to serve it on uh, very often. Here, the United States takes out consular officials because under federal law, you can't serve process on, the, uh, on, a, on a consular officer, officer for any person in the United States. It has to come to our central authority. I was just thinking about when you told us about how you have to make the objection to preserve the right. Can you tell us what language we should use? Yes, service is improper. See, if we're going to go to disposition, 
They could probably do the adjudication with your client here. But disposition's a little tougher. Because if the person isn't noticed, how do you remove from the father? You don't have an impersonal jurisdiction to order the removal if you know where he's at. Obviously, if he's an unknown father, we do a due diligence and call it a day. Now, remember, they'll try and do a due diligence and they will check the LA County Registrar Recorder, the DMV, Post Office, the CYA, prison system, and the guy lives in Guatemala. Uh-uh, they'll try it. No, no. They have to actually go and go through the consular, the, the central authority there. The other problems are we don't translate it so they kick it back. Or the translation is unreadable. It's sometimes we pick it, they kick it back. They don't know where the guy is. The address doesn't exist. That may give the court some room to get at disposition if his, his whereabouts are unknown and then they'll just go under a G and be done with you. Uh, um, so let's say that we get appointed for um, a parent and there's a big issue. Until notice is proper, should we just be making a special parent? Study? Okay, we're going to talk about that, and Ernesto's really going to talk about it. I will talk about it very, very briefly here, because that looms very large in the case law. First off, if, you're, if the mother's here, there's a Jewish in the mother that we get, and the father is in another state, nation state, the first question you should ask, not that you're going to do anything, but you want to know, so you're not blindsided, is there an order of a court in that state determining child custody and visitation? That's what you ask of your client. Now, relax, 99.9% .9 of them, there's no such order. And if you forget to ask, the odds are with you. That it isn't going to be a problem. But you want to know, and you want to know for a reason, because if there could be, your client may be looking at you, and I did a guardianship for a Colombian national a few years ago. The courts there are incredibly corrupt. They're just horribly corrupt. And my client did not want those courts involved at all. And I had a very sympathetic commissioner, and the guardianship got signed. She's here. Let them come get her, get her if they can. Okay? But you want to know, because if, in fact, the consulate here, you serve the central authority, comes back and says, hey, we got, we got a adjudication of child custody. She left the, the, the Ecuador or Mexico or wherever and, and uh, didn't receive our permission now. You're no longer in the service of process. You just defaulted in to an international child abduction case. And that is where the subject matter jurisdiction comes in. And that we'd have to talk about separately. The subject matter jurisdiction can get a little complicated. Um, but it's just like the, and the UCCJEA kicks in at that point, too. We don't want to get into that because, again, that's subject matter jurisdiction. Today. What you need to do is take a look at the Hague Convention. Again, download it. It's... Ten easy pages to read. It's not hard. You want to look and see first, did they use the forms? Are they filled out in the correct language? Are, has there been a translation of the petition? Has it been served in duplicate unless the receiving state says we only need one? Do they usually require two? Take a look at it, when it was served, who it was served on. You've got all your central authorities right there, right at your fingertips. If you find the service is bad, and mom's here, father's in Mexico, Guatemala, or France, doesn't matter, then say, look, we don't have we don't have service. Slow it down. Slow it down. And, let, and particularly slow it down if they release the kid to your client. What do you care at that point? Just slow it down. Because she'll finish her programs and they can dismiss her, they can get her out of here. That would be, I'm not, I better not go too much longer because I have a feeling I'm going to um, get hit from here. There, understand once, once, service has been effectuated pursuant to the Hague Convention. That's it. Don't look for it anywhere else. So if you get it at Jurisdiction Dispo, you're not going to get it, have to do it for review hearings. 2-6, any of them. It's once, once only. 
The other last thing, and I'm going to let Mr. Ray go here, is I want you to avoid any potential IAC claims. Mm -hmm. And that is where we come here. Ernesto is going to speak very clearly <coughs> to the appellate court's views of the Hague Convention. If you can make your special appearance. The problem that you have is you're an attorney, and you work in this area, and since your client isn't here, very often the uh, court takes out a long knife and starts really carving on your client. And the natural instinct at that point is start objecting and start screaming. You can't do any of it. You have to let your client take a hit. You are making a special appearance. You're objecting to lack of proper service. And it's important because they can't terminate his parental rights. And if they can't terminate his parental rights, they can't terminate your clients. They, you know, the disposition, it's touchy whether they can really do a disposition and bifurcate it. They, they'll try it. Would a court of appeal allow it? Probably in this district at least. Some other districts maybe not. Uh, but you can't get to the ultimate guardianship or adoption of your client's children <coughs> if he's not noticed and we know where he's at if we're not giving proper notice because they have no in personam jurisdiction over him. So keep that in mind. I'm going to let, uh, and by the way, if you don't, if you blow that, then the parent does show up. Um, he does get whacked or she gets whacked. Then appellate counsel might be looking and saying, why did counsel do what he or she did? I wouldn't worry about civil liability particularly because <clears throat> most of these people have no concept of what it is. And then you've got your IAC claim, and who wants that? that that's no fun to write, and it's no fun to be the subject of. And as I mentioned uh, about a year, two years ago, uh, when we did a, a, a thing on IAC here, there but for the grace of God, don't any of us, including me, if you've gone through all of my cases, I'll bet you could find an IAC or two. We're all human. Let's not make. Let's not make it. Let's not make it easy for anybody. I'm going to let thank you, Mr. Ray. Thank you. All right. Well, folks, uh, I want to talk a little bit about case law, and I want to analogize the Hague Service Convention to APA. <coughs> in this sense, when uh, APA first started, uh, the appellate courts would give you a reversal of disposition at the two six, and practically with no nothing. And in 2003, you could get an, an equal reversal. The problem was, what's the point? 99.9% .9 of the time, you're not going to get anybody that's Native American. Um, so it was a kind of a hollow victory. Unlike the hollow victory, the Hague Convention gives you an excellent opportunity. Say uh, your firm requires you to accept a case at detention simply because the mom who is there says, you know, dad is in uh, Guadalajara and uh, this is his address. You have to make the appointment. So it's not like you have a whole lot of choice. The question then is what you do and how you do it afterward. You have to look at a positive thing. The positive thing is that you've got six months, very likely a year, of uh, you know, blindsiding the department, basically, because uh, my experience with the Hague is that <coughs> you're about, the department is about as good as serving, at serving Hague notice as they are in ICPA notice, in other words. They don't always get it right, and that's pretty tongue-in-cheek. Um, so if they don't get it right, it's six mi uh, months if they get it perfect. perfect. <coughs> Uh, if they don't, it's well a year. So you've just bought the other parent a chance to get the kids back, assuming that other parent is willing to. Uh, so I, I think that's a rather interesting spin on it, and that's one I'd like for you to consider. You know, the IAC that John talked about is really important to us on appeal because when we get appointed, about all we have is either a writ of habeas corpus or a uh, IAC. None of us want to do that. Because, so we've all been in the same position. I mean, I was doing the same stuff you guys are doing too, too long. Uh, so I would suggest that if you take the case at a uh, petition filing, Dad's never been in the country or wherever, he's not here, 
uh, you have to make sure that you don't do what a panel attorney did up in the fifth floor with Judge Henning. And that's the first case I want to talk to you about. The full case is in your material, so you don't, you know, uh, have to do it. <coughs> Vanessa Hugh. That's the most recent case in mentioned to you out of the Second Appellate District Division 7. Justice Perlis, who used to be Judge Perlis in uh, Debbie Andrews Court, uh, 420, back in before Bob Sandoval, but then I digress. Anyway, he's the one that uh, decided or wrote the opinion on this case, and I know it very well because I was the appellate attorney on it. Uh, the facts on it are much like the facts that we get on typical cases here. The dad was not very sympathetic. He was living in Pico Rivera. His wife got ticked at him beating her up on a regular basis, so she took the two kids, moved in with her mom and dad, his in-laws. He got ticked, so he went at night with a gun and a pistol and was brandishing and put it in between her eyes and it didn't go off. So he did the next best thing. He tied up his in-laws, took them to the living room, took the mother to the living room and raped her. Then that wasn't enough. He drove from uh, their house back to Pico and then in front of his house there was cops. So he kept on going to Guadalajara sent the mother back a few years later. If you tell everybody that you were here voluntarily and that everything was hunky dory, you may see your son again. I'm going to send you back to clear my name. She went to the FBI and made a big uh, effort to get her kid back and eventually got it back, uh, found a lover in her life, remarried and wanted to terminate dad's parental rights over Vanessa. Uh, so that he could uh, adopt her. The same operative law, the same identical operative law. The problem and why I took the time to give you the facts as I wrote them, uh, as they were on the record, is because sometimes you get really crappy clients. I mean, really, really hard to find anything. He was in maximum prison because he had escaped out of prison and had done some heinous crimes in Mexico and basically not a whole lot of going for him other than one thing. Everybody, the judge and everyone knew he was incarcerated in a maximum security uh, prison just outside Brownsville, Texas, on that side of the border. And uh, he was served in accordance with uh, what we call Section 291E, which is uh, certified return receipt mail attached to petition for adoption and the citation translated into the Spanish language, which uh, was mailed to his place of incarceration, return receipt requested, or the international equivalent on file. Judge says, this seems good notice, or sort of notice, let me appoint counsel. Counsel is appointed. Counsel says, well, I have to get in touch with my client. He gets in touch with his client. The, court, the <coughs> client, the dad, writes to the court and says, Hey, you know, mom's making all this stuff up. I'm actually Ozzie and Harriet kind of marriage. This is wonderful. We got no problems. So um, the court uh, finds that uh, since he had appointed counsel, uh, appointed counsel asked for a continuance. Said, uh, look, my client wants a continuance for me to go talk with him in person because. This stuff can't be handled over the phone. They don't have enough uh, facilities in the Mexican uh, max security prison. <coughs> Judge says, this case has been going on for eons. I'm not going to give you a continuance. Can you terminate it for rental rights? Dad appealed a proper appeal. Court of Appeal, Justice Perlis said, two things. The first one is very important because it is the state of the law in this appellate district. There is a new <coughs> article which I happened to run across through the internet and the law review article indicates that Mexico, uh, John just talked about reservations. I being Native American and not trying to imply anything about reservations, but Mexico has no reservations. Each country that signs this 
gets to make their own reservations or not. They said, no, nothing other than central authority. I won't get into letters derogatory and other exceptional circumstances because they don't really apply here. We don't have that time. But what I am saying is that if that is what Mexico wants, the Court of Appeal in this district that says that is the only way. No, uh, no uh, first class mail, no nonsense. It's got to be that way. And I have done quite a few of these uh, unique forms for Mexico. I'll, you know, I'll just redact the first na the names and you can have them. The, the point is that your job is not to do the Hague notice. You should not be doing that. Because the moment you take a general appearance, or one is implied for you, which is what happened in Vanessa. In Vanessa, I went to oral argument. I said, you know, I'm really thrilled that the court has agreed with the law review article as a matter of law. Now, the uh, convention requires for Mexico central authority. That's it. No other. It's not complicated. She said. They said yes, Mr. Ray, but. Um, he asked for a continuance. That's a general appearance, don't you know? <coughs> and they, uh, they affirmed him based on counsel asking for a continuance. So what I'm saying is there is waiver, and there is forfeiture, and then there is the court. The court will imply that as long as there is any evidence a scintilla, they can imply it. It was implied there. The attorney there did not say, I'm making a special appearance uh, in order to contact my client. In the 5th District, I won't mention the parties, but I write for other divisions, and one of them has, uh, one of the judges in dependency court has told the county to serve Hague notice on appointed counsel. So they just appoint an attorney, take back uh, notice to, under the Hague, to the representative, and, uh, hey, we don't need no stinking convention. That's the way it is. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen here, but my uh, caution to you is, if you take a case, make sure you don't argue any of the merits whatsoever, even the request uh, for a continuance. I am appearing specially for the uh, mother, father, whoever you're appointed for, whichever you're appointed for, and that's it. I have not been able to contact my client and speak no further, no matter what is asked of you, because then you have given, you've in effect uh, given the Court of Appeal an opportunity to imply a binding. And what if the court then goes ahead and terminates your client's objection? Are you allowed to say, please note my objection, I'm still specially appearing? Or what do you do? Just say, you know, if, the, uh, uh, if you have made a special appearance, you don't have a right to argue right. an objection as to the merits. Is an objection as to the merits, you just wait your client's appearance the next day, say, on a, on a case that you least expected. I had a terrible case most of you have heard of, Lance Holmes. The guy was the least person on this planet I thought would sue. But his grandmother, his mother, sued. The last person on earth. A heroin uh, addict uh, in jail, uh, not really someone you would expect. So I would say no. I would just say, I, uh, please, uh, please note, I am only specially appearing. I'm specially appearing for Mr. Uh, and I have had no contact. And then, then the right but Marpet will do what Marpet will do anyway. But the rights are terminated. Oh, then you Sorry. write to your client and have him send in the notice of appeal in his name. Well, if you have had no contact with your client, how are you going to do that? You ask to be relieved for want of a client. I wish that. to be relieved before he impanels the 2-6. Your Honor, before the court impanels the hearing, or before you start opening your mouth, Relieve me. I've had no contact. Please relieve me and set me free. I'm, okay, so I'm actually appearing. I've had no contact with my client. Please relieve me. Right. And I wouldn't wait till the, the day of the hearing. I would do it a week. That's what I thought about my motion. But we don't mention the real world. We're yes, the real like world five is... five minutes before lunch. Here, take this. You've got to get out of here. That's true. It, all day. It, <coughs>
That's true. Look, you can do it one of two ways. You can have a canned motion to withdraw. If you don't have one, we can give one to you. Uh, Ellen, uh, any of you, just file a motion to withdraw like you would uh, a 388 at the eve of the 26, right there on the spot. Can you say I refuse, I, I'm declining to take this appointment? You can decline an appointment, but then you've got a problem with the head of your organization, don't you? Well, that's, yeah, I haven't I mean, been you know, you're you're down, to you know, you I'm can. doing the best I can. The, the purpose of label <laughs> is to represent parents, and the purpose of the, of the appointment is if you have contact information, it is that person's right to know. And they're appointing you to try to get a hold of him. They're not appointing you to actually get a hold of him because that requires a crystal ball. They're appointing you to stand in and be a placeholder so they can do what they want and you're left holding a, a, a bag. malpractice bag. Uh, Linda, <laughs> Linda, Linda, you can always object to the lack of proper notice. That, that you can always do. Always object to that. That you have the perfect right to object to. The merits of the action, you can't. Now, the problem is, and I think, just to make it clear, if you make that general appearance, your duty as an attorney, particularly if you have contact with your client, is to communicate with your client. That can be difficult because your client may be speaking uh, a language that is difficult to get find a, tra a translator for. Your letter, you can send it in English, but I don't think that meets the requirements of the state bar rules. Because he's not going to be, or she is not going to be able to read it. And they may have no way of reading it. So you've got to go out and find someone who can translate into a Mayan language. Because you don't care about the official language, you've actually got to communicate with that client. And good luck finding one. It's not easy. So you don't want to waive the objection to notice, because if you do that, it all falls on you. And that's what we don't want to do. We don't want it on us. That's why you have a department that has a budget of close to a billion dollars, I think, with all the federal monies. You know, they go out and hire somebody to do it. Why should you do it? You have a question? Just quickly, but I'm still trying to get the steps as to the best practices. So in the 2-6 scenario, if the court in its rush is doing that to us, of course we're going to make a special appearance. And that's all we'll say. But we'll make a special appearance because we're objecting to notice. I but, get but, that. But by now, the time of the 2-6... Hang, hang on one second. The court that that. My question is, is <coughs> All subsequent hearings are void as to him. Remember, the court takes jurisdiction over the child, not over the parent. But as soon as the parent makes an appropriate notice or an appropriate a, a, a general appearance or notice is proper within 291, then the court acquires personal jurisdiction. And with in personam jurisdiction, the court can then, the trial court can then do whatever it wants in terms, well, theoretically within reason for reunification services or visitation and the like. So what you want to get off the case is as soon as you give the prospective client an opportunity, you've exhausted whatever remedy you have in terms of contact, get the hell off. You don't belong in the case. You're trying to, re you're trying to be a ghost. Leave that to Norton. What, what about in the alternative when you, when you actually do contact the client? So you, you make the special appearance, the Hague notice isn't cor isn't correct yet, clearly, because you're at the detention or PRC or whatever. You're able to make contact with the client, but you don't believe waiving is going to be in your client's interest. Do you continue to make a special appearance even though you've had contact and just continue to adjust Absolutely. notice as a special Absolutely. appearance? Absolutely. Uh, Jennifer Rowe is Lori Fields. I think most of you know Lori Fields is an appellate attorney. She has a case, had a case just after mine, uh, just after Vanessa Q. It's called Jennifer O. And it's in this district as well. Uh, the issue was what applies. You know, since 
the detention hearing can be by oral notice? Does it does the Hague Convention apply to the detention hearing? And the answer is a simple one. They went through and uh, analyzed the two granddaddy cases. Uh, you know, basically they analyzed Elisa S, which is, you know, the watershed case. It's the BG of Hague Convention. And what it said <coughs> is that the Hague Convention applies up until Vanessa Q, uh, Vanessa Q my case, the, uh, the law was you could uh, serve, in some instances, by mail. And so people were sending uh, notices by mail, and the courts were accepting them. The, that changed. But in Jennifer O, uh, like all ICWA, you know, as I started out by saying, it used to be really easy to get a reversal. Now they've come up with all manner of stuff because they're sick of tying the court, trial court's hands. They don't want to bog them down. I understand there's some new judges that take all day. And some old all, all ones that follow their lead. So what what was well all day to get out of their temple. Oh, oh. Yeah, now most of you guys are here till four thirty. When are you supposed to do your case reviews and, and such like? It's uh, you know in any event the, the point that I was making is that in Jennifer O, they, they went through that analysis and they said, well, we're going to start by cutting. This was an interesting thing. Uh, you don't need uh, it for a supplemental petition. So if you get a 342, no, no uh, hate convention needs to be followed. A uh, subsequent petition, a uh, 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 387, no need. So they limited right off the top, basically, to the Juris Dispo um, hearings. Because they're in California bifurcated hearings, we really mean the Dispo hearing. Because they can't adjudicate the petition on behalf of the child, but they, if the child is present. If the child is, well, there's a, a lot of case law, but basically, get off the case as soon as you can. Do not worry about subsequent ones. And if you have been appointed and are on uh, special appearance status, your job is to make sure that the court actually orders. Do we have notice? Do we have hang notice? Is the court finding hang notice proper? That is not going to the substance of the case. But if on appeal, later on, you want to take this one on appeal, you have no record. You have waived it or forfeited. Now, um, someone, I think Emily, you asked about waiver and uh, forfeiture. Yeah, just to make it clear, um, basically, waiver is supposed to be annoying or at least a voluntary giving up of a right, and forfeiture is failing to raise it below. Almost uniformly, the courts in this district are saying you either waive it or you forfeit it. Because you didn't raise the objection below, you didn't make the special appearance. If you make the special appearance, but you let the department slide on notice. You don't look at the notice to make sure that the notice has the right person's name or even the right address. I mean, you've seen some of these equipment notices. They're not all that good. Well, it follows logic that uh, the Hague notices aren't a whole lot better. In fact, because they require translated documents, I'd say 99% of the time they're not adequate. And since Mexico has made no reservations that if this is followed, we'll waive this or we'll let this happen, they, they don't have that. So if, you're, um, if you want to avoid a forfeiture argument and have your appeal dismissed, please ask the court. You're not making a general appearance. You're not doing anything except making a record for your client that notice is not proper, you bought the other parents some additional time. That may or may not be good, and that's something you have to assess. But if you want to protect yourself, that's it. I'm going to turn it over to you for, oh, um. Let, let, let me just clarify one thing. He'd ask, at the 2-6, he's saying get off. If you haven't had contact with your client, I agree. If you're in active communication with your client, you want to be at that 2-6, raise an objection to the notice. And sit down. Look, the bottom line here is, if you're in contact with your client, you can always send them a notice of appeal. You'll type it out, mail it to him. If he mails it back, 
great, he gets his appeal, he doesn't. That's his, it's his choice. Um, but you do <coughs> want to deal with that. And I, I, I would point out, the picture <coughs> over here, because there is, the Hague Convention really doesn't fit with juvenile court dependency law, the timeline. It just doesn't. It was really designed for something else. And so there's a lot of resentment on the parts of the Court of Appeal towards it. Um, and what he, Ernesto is really saying is it's a trap. They're, they're setting a trap for the unwary. And just avoid the trap. And once you avoid the trap, your job, most of your job is done. And in fact, it's a lot easier on you because, you know, you're not subpoenaing witnesses and getting ready for an adjudication because your client has not been noticed. One tip that I would suggest, since you're going over to another hearing, very often when there's a Hague notice, it's not attached to your reports. They need to provide you with a copy of that notice. <coughs> and you have the court order them to do it. Because then you'll examine it. If you get a couple of days ahead of time, it's even better. You can sit there, examine, pick it apart, make your objection. And then move on. Um, you can even set, see if the court, some courts will allow you to set a progress report or status conference or any, they'll call it any number of other things on the take notice. And if it's bad, you just point it out. And then guess what? Move on. All you're doing here is making sure that personal jurisdiction is obtained. Once it's obtained, anywhere under the Hague, everything else, that's the last notice they have to give me. Then it all falls on you. Well, make it fall on the department. Can you ask for courtesy service to the parent? No. After that's done? Oh, after, after, after they've yeah, done after proper. Oh, sure, because, they're, they're, because they've affected in personal jurisdiction, right. so there's no longer a special appearance. Right. So when you generally appear, okay, in future hearings, I want my client served according to what? California or yes, but I would ask for something else. Well, they, if it's outside the state, yeah, you get longer the time lines. Yeah, the timeline. <coughs> but um, also ask, let's say your, your client uh, speaks whatever language, ask that the notice be in that language. They can say no, but if the court orders it, that covers you, doesn't it? <coughs> so you just ask, look, my client speaks um, Mayan, Tibetan. <laughs> Whatever, he's Tibetan, Your Honor. No, but if there's yeah. no written alphabet, no <laughs> how do they do that? Well, then they, what I would like to... Uh, an <laughs> oral tradition. It's, a, it's an oral tradition. <laughs> then, Linda, they should send you down, pay expen all expense paid vacation to the Yucatan with someone who speaks the language. Take two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, one thing that I'm seeing as a possible um, red flag here is if they're required to translate the document into whatever language it happens to be, let's say for, for purposes of this example that it's not Spanish or English, something they can easily decipher. Um, it, are you, when you're checking notice, I mean, are you obligated to ascertain whether it's an appropriate? I mean, you can't. I'm thinking if it's if it's been translated into a language that I don't know, I can't ever say notice is proper. I can't ever concur because I can't ever. Say to the court, yes, this was the proper translation well, of these documents. The question I would, I would ask. Nor can the court, really. But, you know, when we translate documents uh, for court, we usually have a certified interpreter, don't we? Yes, yes. With an oath on file or an oath. Maybe they should attach that certificate to it, because I'm going to tell you something. If, if Even in Spanish, if it gets down to Mexico and they're looking at it and they don't like what they're reading, or it's a mess, Guess what? You know, uh, they may take it back anyway. So it, it probably would be a good practice to ask for that. Now, there's some countries you don't have to worry about. We have a list of all the countries, by the way, that are involved in this. Um, you know, one I noticed wasn't there was Vatican City, but if they had any children coming out of that, they should. <laughs> <laughs> that, that you'd have to do in Latin. Um, let me add that. Get the certificate of interpreter. Let me add that uh, Mexico requires an apostille, which is a stamp. You know, they just blow little stamps. Uh, so you get your interpreter here to uh, stamp it. 
just like they would if the court ordered it in Spanish, then there's no question about what it says. It's the same identical for other countries. And by the way, so as long as it's stamped right. or there's a, a certification there, yeah, you're, a, you're off the hook. Yeah. Okay. yeah, the other thing is we use the term letters of People hear that and they talk, what the hell is that? A letter of orgatory is really a simple thing. It's a request from one judicial officer or court from the assistance for another court. That's all it is. And, you know, if a particular country wants a letter of orgatory, then you may be able to, through here, contact them and see what form they wanted. Um, obviously, the, for our bench officer, being English, you have to have a translation. Um, and then they may want an apostille or not, and it's spelled P-I-L-L-E. It's very much close to apostle, but it isn't. And it, it's just, think of the Stamp Act, you know, from your, your high school American history lesson. That's all it is, it's just a stamp, it's tax. They, they get you to pay for it. The other thing that you need to keep in mind is some of these countries charge money for some of the services that go through them. Um, that's another reason to leave it on DCMS. Um, because if there's any expense involved, let, let the state of California or the county of Los Angeles pay for it. Don't, don't get into the money issue. Any other questions? I have one question. So after a big notice requirements are met, do you then just make general appearances if you're in contact? Yeah, there's in-person jurisdiction at that point. Full in-person jurisdiction. And so you can argue the merits. And uh, obviously, you know, one of the things to keep in mind, particularly with Mexico, they have they have a DIF there. That's their social services organization. Now the countries may. And uh, particularly if your client wants the child to go to grandma in Guatemala or Brazil, well, I don't know what Brazil's on here, but uh, there's a lot of conventions they're not part of. You know, the Hague Convention also gives notice to that government. That's another thing in this instance. And if they have their own child welfare authorities and there's a home that's suitable there, it may be better to get the child out of the country. And that is an alternative argument to make to the court that we're not only giving notice to the individual, but we're also giving notice to the, the nation state itself. So if these are nationals of that nation state, they can uh, provide for it. Before I forget, I wanted to give one closing comment. In my, in my experience, the most important thing we can leave you with today is the need to maintain special appearance. Because anything else is going to get you in trouble down the line. Maybe not this case, maybe next. And uh, the, the uh, argument you need to make in the court, if the court wants you to argue about waiver or um, forfeiture, you can just live straight out of in Ray Dakota age. Uh, I think most of us have, uh, you know, that's, that's the case on uh, the seminal case on waiver and forfeiture. It explains that they're basically the identical same thing. We're going to screw you in, under either doctrine. Um, and they will. Yeah. So it's Dakota H on uh, waiver and forfeiture. Uh, I didn't bring the copy, but I'm sure you can find it easily. And uh, I think that you can lift the argument if you have that kind of a case. Um, you know, just keep that in mind. The, uh, just conceptualize this for a moment, and you'll find how easy this is. Service on a central authority or a record designated representative. Dual copies unless excused. You have all the regulation <coughs> exceptions here, so you know. Um, this will tell you who that website will tell you who the central authority is for the designated individuals to accept the service. You've got it. It's either there, and it's got to be translated, of course, in the official language or some other language designated by the receiving state. It'll tell you if you call the central authority or the consular office. Consular office will tell you. Um, and then you just look at the notice. You're done. You know, you know where you're going with it. This is not hard. It's just paying attention to the detail. That's all. Because you paid attention to the detail, you get six more months, you get a year more, 
and everybody else is having the rights terminated like mad, and you're sitting there, relaxed, in the shade. Any more questions? We need to wrap it up so that you can wrap up the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's my